Thank you so much, Paul, for your, your music ministry this morning. Today in our worship time, we have the great joy of baptizing Isaac Hoffley and Brody Liebold, who have answered the call of Jesus Christ and have surrendered their lives to him in faith. And with that, that heavenly crowd, there's a heavenly crowd described in Revelation 19. And so with them, we say, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Praise God. He planned our salvation before the creation of the world. He had us in mind. He knew, he knew that like Adam and Eve, that we would fall into sin, that we would get cut off from him, and, and, and that in such trouble, destined for destruction, we could never save ourselves. God knew that we would need a savior and, and so when the time was right, he gave his one and only son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Our Messiah, Jesus, was crucified for our sins. He died on the cross, but he's alive. He's raised from the dead. He's with us today through his Holy Spirit. He's conquered sin and Satan and death. And he makes it possible for us to share his victory. Now he is exalted. He is exalted and glorious. And he reigns and rules with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Romans 10 verse 9 assures us that if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's incredible news, isn't it? There's no better news than that. That's the gospel. Everyone needs the gospel, this good news of Jesus and his kingdom. We need him. And, and for, 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 for each of us, we, we, we need to get to know him personally. And so, so it begins with a divine appointment. A divine appointment set up and led by the Holy Spirit. There's no formula for this. And you, you see this in the book of Acts. There are so many different ways that people encounter Jesus and are brought to faith in him. Everyone's story is, is, is a bit different. Early in the eighth chapter of Acts, we see Philip preaching to large crowds. He's in Samaria, going full throttle, telling everyone about the Messiah. Jesus, who was crucified but is now risen. Many, many people are set free from evil spirits. Many are healed. And, and trusting in Jesus, many enter the kingdom of God. And they seal their decision with baptism. God is at work in, in, in this incredible way in this big way and then then in verse 26 philip receives new marching orders it, it must have been puzzling now an angel of the lord said to philip go south go south to the road the desert road that goes down from jerusalem to gaza and so he started out he started out by faith, <laughs> trusting that these instructions were from the Lord. You know, he, he was sent right out to the edge of nowhere. Gaza was in southwestern Israel. The last place you get, get water before hitting the desert. There might have been a few tents here and there along the road, but, but nothing to put on a map. Why would an evangelist be sent out into the wilderness? Why would Philip 
why should Philip leave the crowds and go there? He doesn't get an explanation. You know, it's rare that we do. When the Lord gives us instructions, he just typically just asks us to trust him. I mean, sometimes we might have some insight into why, why he's calling us to do something, but often we don't. We don't have the big picture. Philip doesn't know why he's supposed to be on that road, but, but he goes. And so Luke says, so he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So he's a long way from home, probably a five-month journey. We don't know exactly, but that was one estimate I read. Ethiopia at that time referred to Nubia, which is it's now part of Sudan, so it's just north of modern Ethiopia. So Nubia was a powerful, independent African na- nation. It was, it was a, a kingdom outside, outside the Roman Empire. And so out on that deserted road, Philip meets its minister of finance. As, as a eunuch, this man was castrated. That was common for servants who worked closely with a queen in that time. Professionally, he's at the top of the pyramid. Spiritually, he is devoted to the living God. There's a lot we don't know about him. Is he an African Jew? Because we, we know that there is a, a historic Jewish community in, uh, in that part of the world, um, even, even further south in what's now Ethiopia. Or, or is he a Gentile? Is he a God-fearer who's drawn to the Lord but not fully Jewish. Either way, as, as a castrated man, he faced barriers at the temple. Deuteronomy 23 verse 1 says, no one who's been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. So at the temple, he could probably get as far as the court of the Gentiles, but, but no further. And I wonder then, so he went to the, the, the temple in Jerusalem to worship. And what was that like for him? And I wonder, how do others see him? Do they, do they judge him odd? Do they feel awkward around this man? We don't really know. But we do know that God loves him, that God loves this man. The religion of Jerusalem kept him on the fringes an outsider, but God sent a messenger to him. You know, a huge part of ministry is just showing up and, and then discovering how the Lord is already at work. Long before Philip met this Ethiopian, the Holy Spirit had been stirring in this man's heart, creating a hunger for God. The evangelist Leighton Ford tells how one of his friends visited a county jail and led a seasoned criminal to Jesus. Well, after this man's decision, he said, now preacher, don't get a big head because I accepted Christ. You're just the 25th man. At least 24 others had told him about Jesus. God had been at work in his life long before this pastor came on the scene. So remember, whenever you meet someone, God, you can be sure that God has been interested and involved in their life far beyond what you know. You're simply part of an ongoing story. We all are. And so introducing the Ethiopian eunuch, Luke says this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting on his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. Now, only a wealthy man could have afforded his own copy of Isaiah. This was long before the printing press. Every scroll had to be written out by hand. So I wonder, was this one new? Had had the eunuch just picked it up in, in Jerusalem? 
He's, he's so eager to dive in, right? He's, he's reading it on, on the journey. I don't know about you, but I find it a little bit hard to read when I'm, when I'm in, a, in a vehicle, a moving vehicle. He was in a chariot. I don't imagine it was a real smooth road. So you know, he could have been stopped at the side of the road. We, we, don't, we don't know for sure, but he was eager, clearly, <laughs> to get in to God's word. In those days, reading was almost always done out loud, not silently like we normally do. So the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then, then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. What a great question. You know, this is such an important skill. It's one I'm still learning. How to ask good questions. Notice how Philip, as an evangelist, starting a conversation, he didn't just launch into a presentation of the gospel. He's not following a script. I don't know if you've noticed, but, but very few people appreciate hearing a lecture out of the blue. Anyone else notice that? <laughs> kind of getting buttonholed with a, a one-way message. If, if you want to share Jesus... <laughs> If you have a heart to see others come to know him, it's usually much, much better to ask questions. Do you have much of a spiritual background? What people have most shaped your beliefs? What's most influenced you to come to your current conclusions? How would you describe your spiritual journey? What values and causes are you most passionate about? Why? What gives meaning and purpose to your life? What do you think about Jesus? <laughs> Have you ever thought about God in your life before? There's so many possible questions you could ask, right? <laughs> we need to ask the Holy Spirit for, for direction in like every, every conversation we're in. And listen well. Be genuinely curious and caring. Right? Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and give you wisdom. Philip here is the eunuch reading from Isaiah. And, and so he asks this natural question. Do you understand what you're reading? <laughs> How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. And so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The Holy Spirit had clearly prepared both, both of these men, both the Ethiopian and Philip, for this conversation. Luke says, this is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. It was from Isaiah 53. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. So this man is on Isaiah 53, this prophecy about an innocent, suffering servant of the Lord who would die for our sins. <laughs> in the whole Old Testament, it's one of the, the clearest prophecies about Jesus. It says he would bear our sin, our, our punishment, our pain, so that we could have peace. By his wounds, we are healed. Isaiah says. So the eunuch asks Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? That's an essential question. The essential question. Who is this? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Jesus is at the center of every gospel conversation. Without him, it's just religious talk. I'm sure we've all had religious conversations that really were not about Jesus. The heart of Christian faith is not a philosophy or a formula or even a lifestyle. It's a person, Jesus Christ. What, what details does Philip share? How does he convey the incredible uniqueness of Jesus. What stories does he tell? What pieces of teaching? What miracles? 
What does he say about his crucifixion and resurrection? How, how does he introduce Jesus to this Ethiopian man who's maybe never heard of him, or maybe he heard a few things when he was in Jerusalem? We don't know. Well, for sure, Philip would share certain facts. But, but, I, but I wonder, does he also help the eunuch understand how it is that the gospel and why it is that the gospel is so important for him personally? You know, at one level, the message is the same for each of us. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We, we're, we're redeemed through the same sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And, and it's because of his resurrection from the dead that, that we can receive eternal life. It's in the same way that everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. So wherever you go, no matter what culture or community, the gospel's the same. But at the same time, Jesus does meet each of us where we are and shows us our saving, his saving power for our situation. Salvation is not, not just a gift that we only begin to unpack after we die. It's for today. And the Holy Spirit, it's his job to bring it home for us, to bring it home to us. And so I wonder, as Philip explains the gospel to the Ethiopian man, does he mention anything about the prophecy of Isaiah 56, just a few chapters after, after the, the section the eunuch was reading about? Because Isaiah 56 says, Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch... Hmm, wonder if that would hit home for him. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. Right? For this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what, choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. To them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. So I wonder, does Philip explain how Jesus Christ completely changes the foundation of our relationship with God? And so the eunuch, even in his brokenness, is no longer at any spiritual disadvantage. You know, we're all broken in different ways. <laughs> we, we're all gifted in, in unique ways as well. But the way that the gospel works itself out in our lives and the specific impacts it has will look different in each of our lives. By faith, the eunuch, he'll be part of the holy temple built together in Jesus, no longer a stranger or foreigner, but a precious living stone in the spiritual house of God. You know, we each have a unique story of salvation. When we first receive Jesus, we, we often just understand a sliver of what he's done for us. And that's okay. That's, that's normal. That's, that's how it is. You know, because he calls us to be disciples, to be, to be learners who keep growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a lifetime journey, right? And so when we're baptized, that marks the beginning. It doesn't mean I've arrived now. It means I, I, I've... I've trusted Jesus and I've started on this road with him. And now just like it was for the eunuch, there are things about the kingdom of God which pertain especially to you and me. I wonder how long did he and, and Philip talk out there in the desert? You know, we, we don't really know. But as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's some water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? But clearly, the Holy Spirit had led him to faith in Jesus Christ. That, that you know, wh however far he had been brought <laughs> before this conversation, in this moment, he had met Jesus Christ. And, and he was ready to say, yeah, I'm all in. <laughs> I believe he's the Son of God. 
He's my Savior. And so he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then, then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. And Philip baptized him. Baptism, as we've talked about a lot, we've talked about in our, our baptism class, and, and um, you know, as we know from, from the Word of God, it marks a radically new beginning. It's a visible sign of our response to Jesus Christ. It, it speaks to His living water, washing away our sins, forgiving us, cleansing us, giving us a clean conscience and a fresh start. It's not the water that, that does that, but the water pictures. The water pictures that work of Jesus Christ brought to us, brought home to us through the Holy Spirit. And it testifies to the, that outpouring, outpouring of the Holy Spirit and his, his continuing work in us. In, in baptism, we identify with Jesus. Jesus in his death and resurrection. Jesus who raises us from death to life. So, so Romans chapter 6, and there, there Paul writes, all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus, into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death spiritually there right? we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the father we too may live a new life as one translation says that we may walk in newness of life i, I just love that way of putting it in baptism we commit to a lifetime of following jesus seeking his priorities, receiving and sharing his love and truth, even with enemies, even if it means suffering and death. And of course, we need, you know, we, we rely on him for his help because none, none of us do this perfectly. We need his grace along the way. <laughs> and we need him to lift us up when we, when, we, when we fall. And when we turn to him and say, Lord, Lord, I messed up. Lord, I sinned. Lord, please forgive me. Please restore me. He'll do that. He'll do that for us. And, and, uh, and we, we, we've also looked to our, to our brothers and sisters for support and help, and we want to give them encouragement too. Because this baptism also symbolizes our adoption into God's family as a son or daughter. It, it symbolizes Jesus making us part of his church with disciples from every nation and culture and language. The, whole, the, the Holy Spirit brought Philip and the Ethiopian together for just a short time. Luke, Luke says, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. What happened there? There, 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 there's a lot of debate about what Luke is describing here. Did, did the Holy Spirit miraculously transport Philip like, like maybe something like I, Elijah had been lifted to heaven? Or is he talking about something like he's so filled with the Holy Spirit that, that he's hardly conscious of anything else until he finds himself in Azotus? Well, we, we don't know. But either way, the Spirit of God gets him to where he needs to be. And, and, and Philip keeps spreading the good news of Jesus. What happened to the eunuch? The Bible says nothing more about him. But, but about 140 years later, a church leader, Irenaeus, wrote that, that this eunuch had taken the gospel to Ethiopia. And, and so that conversation, and well, we certainly know that by the time of Irenaeus that there was a, th a thriving church in Ethiopia. Um, so... So that conversation on the road to Gaza may have opened a whole nation to the good news of Jesus Christ. It was a divine appointment. The same is true for us today. God has called us here, each one of us, and especially Brody and Isaac. It's, it's such a joy to stand with you as you take this step of faith today. 
It's been such a, a privilege to, to, to get to know each of you better together with, with our, the rest of our baptism class over this past year, studying and uh, talking together and, and preparing for this day. I know that God has such good plans for you in, in his kingdom. And so, Isaac and Brody, I invite you to come forward first each on, on your own to tell us a bit about your faith in Jesus Christ and why you'd like to be baptized today. Well, maybe would you just go in alphabetical order. Maybe Isaac can come first and then Brody, and then I'll ask you both up together at the same time. But first, we'll, we'll start with, with Isaac. 